morning. Can you hear me now? Would you pray with me? Holy righteous Father, we're so bankrupt and so uh, can't do nothing without you. Please, Father, send your spirit here to guide our speaking and the hearing, uh, to absolutely do away with any human thoughts or imaginations. Uh, to stick truly to the Word of God and let the Spirit discern what you would wish me to say and others to understand. And we know that we can do nothing without you, and only through Christ can we do anything. So touch my lips, as we are, are all a people of unclean lips. We truly depend upon you, Father. Without you, we can do nothing. Have your way with us, Spirit of God, and let us preach the word to the glory of God, who only is worthy of the praise, honor, and through Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Some of those songs really get to me and they pull my heart string, so I think it kind of softens up the heart for worship. And uh, you know, I noticed this morning on the new yesterday that the Sanhedrin is actually sacrificing a lamb, a Passover lamb this year. First time they've done it, 2,000 years. Interesting. I'm not saying get in your bunkers and you know prepare for the, the tribulation, but I think those are little things that happen that God is trying to tell us, you know, hey, you pay attention uh, to what's going on in Israel because kind of a hub of things that go on in Israel. Uh, so it's kind of important. And, you know, there was a guy I talked to about three or four years ago for two or three years, and he did not believe in the Bible. And, and one of them is, a couple of them are my first cousins that kind of turned over this weekend. I was trying to share some of this. But anyway, the one guy that was, uh, I won't mention his name, but I went there and he wanted to know more about the Bible. So I brought him some uh, stuff about manuscripts, Bible manuscripts, and the overwhelming evidence that this was, you know, the Word of God. He didn't believe it. Then I went through prophecies. There's like 800 prophecies. Uh, 450 are, have already been fulfilled, and this couldn't have happened by chance. And he didn't argue. He argued with it. He didn't agree. And then I showed him the myth of evolution because you can't test it in science. You know, it's something not repeatable, observable. That's the, how you find out things are true. I gave up. I said, you know, well, I gave up. And, and about two and a half months later, I got a message from this guy. It's a true story. He said he was, he was weeping. And he, I go, well, what happened? And he goes, I'm sorry. I, I, I believe in God. And I, I, I don't know what to say. Well, what convinced you? I mean, did the evidence and, you know, and did the, you know, scientific and all this other stuff. And he, he says, no, you, you love me enough to let me yell and scream at you. And tell was something about you didn't give up on me. And so I came to Christ because you kept loving me. I didn't prove to him anything. Amen. That was the Spirit of God. So that took about three or four months. And this guy apologized. And it was not real recent. But I wish a lot of my other family would do that because they're not so like that. So you can't convince anybody to believe. And I was a reluctant uh, witness because I thought he's going to go over there and beat me up again. And he did. Normally he did beat me up. And some of them, I mean, not physically, but uh, as being a Christian and uh, you and your sky daddy, you know, Jesus and all this other stuff and insults. And so I kept taking it and I didn't respond. And eventually, see, the Spirit of God does the love one. So I wanted to share that with you. That's a pretty powerful. I, I about wept with, well, I didn't about, I did weep with him. But this is kind of the same thing. I always like the same thing. Jonah, I didn't want to go over there. I knew this was a guy who was going to rip into me. And he was like an enemy, uh, an argument. He would post stuff that would attack me online and all this other stuff. And, and about a, a year ago, he contacted me. He wanted to know more. So I, I've been going back and forth with this guy. I was like Jonah, the prophet. By the way, Jonah's name means called. Interesting, because he was called by God. Guess what? God, like you said, Tom, God calls us what we are a lot of times, or we will be before God. So that's kind of interesting, I thought. So I'm going to do a survey of the book of Jonah and show how we are reluctant at times but it doesn't depend on our reluctancy or, or, man, I really butchered that. It doesn't depend on that. It depends on the love. And, and, and trying to share that, you don't go up and be insulted because you know what's uh, necessarily, I'm going to like this. It's not going to be like. But you do it out of love. Uh, you're willing to risk offending somebody because you love them enough to save them out of hell. So when I met Paul, I went and sat down next to him, and I didn't know what to expect. And so 
But I did it, and I didn't want to do it. I go, what if he thinks, and you know, what if he's a, you know, and what if he just got out of prison, and you know, just fill in the blanks. But my mind says, nope, I'm being like Jonah. So I'm going to do a survey of the book of Jonah. It's going to be interesting to show you how we're a lot like Jonah. And, and I say we. I may not get through the whole book, but this book has got some good stuff in it. Jesus quoted from the book of Jonah. Uh, you know, Jesus didn't believe in evolution. He said, you know, Adam and Eve were created. He created a male and female, not amoeba amoebas, okay? They were not single-cell organisms. And he quoted the book of Jonah. So Jesus believed in the Old Testament, and he did not believe in evolution because all, all he quoted was he believed in. So in verse 1, by the way, at verse 1, chapter 1, Jonah, I may not get through this whole book, but this has got a lot of stuff into it. Uh, and okay. The word of the Lord came to Jonah which means called. So God called him. I'm going to call you and call you called. And, and that means because he's got a special calling. We'll see. The son of Amittai saying, Arise or get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, meaning a huge city. Now if God calls something great, guess what? It's probably big or great or huge. And cry against it, meaning shout out, cry or witness to them for their wickedness has come up before God. Nineveh were, were related to the Assyrians. The Assyrians took the northern tribe captive. They were the arch enemies of Israel. And so this would be like me going, okay, God's called me. I'm going to go over there and witness to the Muslims or to ISIS uh, who wants to destroy us. And Jonah and I are going to do the same thing. We're going to turn around, do a 180, and head the right other way because it's not going to be fun and it's dangerous. Don't think that Jonah didn't think about if he went in there to a pagan nation, <sighs> you don't think about that. That may have been part of the reason why he didn't want to go. I think it had more to do with that than this, uh, what I just said. But Jonah rose up and ran to, no, he fleed. He ran to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. By the way, can you run from the presence of the Lord? Uh-uh. You can run, 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 force, run, and it ain't going to help. You can't run from the Lord. So he already didn't understand. He went down to Jehovah. Notice that word. He went down. And I keep repeating that word, down. He, when you're disobeying the will of God, it's always a way down. You go down, down, down. I don't think that was a coincidence that he put that in there. And you'll see that come up again. And he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare and went down into the pit. See, when you're resisting God's will like Jonah did, like I did, you're not going up, you're going down. Down in the sense of bad things are going to happen. That's what the word, that's why he keeps repeating that. God doesn't say incidental words for no reason. Okay? It is a purpose behind this. And so I kept going down or I went the other way. Because I tried to resist going to this man. Because I knew he would chew me up and sit me out pretty much there. So he went down into it, into it, into what? Into the ship, in, to go with him to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Again, he wants to go from the presence of the Lord. There is no place that I know of that if there is no presence. Even in hell, they say God is present in hell because of he is everywhere. He is uh, omniscient, omnipresent. He is everywhere, always at the same time. But the Lord sent out a great when into the sea. The word sin is, a, is kind of a weak word because if I had something like this, and I wish I had a prop like that, you know what the word sent means? He cast it like a javelin. He's taking this storm and going, Pfft. that's the word that he uses. So it's not like, well, I'm going to make a storm go past. Uh -uh. He sent the storm as like a javelin in the air and a great wind into the sea. Verse 4, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was broken, likely to be broken. Is the way that it would work is there was such a bad storm it looked like the ship was going to be right. If you've ever been on a wooden ship before, it's been a lot of years that I was on one, you can hear and the more tossed the storm is tossing you around, we didn't get in the storm. You can hear, it sounds like it's just going to break apart. I think that's what he's saying. It sounds like the ship is just about ready to snap. And they're all going to go down. <coughs> Guess what? There are not a lot of atheists on the sea, storms in a boat like that. Not for long. <laughs> then 
the mariners were afraid and every man cried unto his God, little G, and cast forth the wares that were into the ship, into the sea to lighten them. There's another thing. Unbeliever, uh, believers that are outside of the will of God can actually hurt those around them. These men suffered loss because of Jonah's disobedience. So that's the point. That is something that's not lost, I think, in the text. They were in the ship, into the sea, to lighten it, but Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay, and he was fast asleep. You know, you can, that shows me, you can have actually peace with God being outside of the will of God. You can be at peace with yourself for a little while. Because he was sleeping in a storm, outside of the will of God, kind of like Jesus sleeping in the boat. How in the world could he sleep in a boat like that? So how can he sleep? I think there is an explanation, and I'll see if I can get to you. The shipmaster, verse 6, came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Get up! Arise and call upon your God. Now that's different. That's a capital G. That's, we're talking about a real God. If so, be that God will think upon us and then we die. No. Verse, uh, the verse, end of verse 7. So guess what? They cast lots. And the lot fell on Jonah. Here are pagans casting lots to see who the real problem person is. They'll identify the, the reason the storm was there. Somebody had done something wrong. That's interesting because they associated bad luck or all whatever or bad circumstances with God being angry. That's interesting. They've got kind of an idea of God, but they don't really know God yet. Then, he, then they said to him, Tell us, pray you, whose cause this evil is upon us. In other words, okay, Jonah, what did you do wrong? Tell me what you did wrong. What's your occupation? And where are you coming from? And what is your country? And what people are you? They were peppering him with questions because the lot fell on him. They knew he was responsible. Those are a lot of good questions. Johnny didn't even answer them all. I thought, well, he's going to answer this one and then this one. Uh -uh. Listen to what he said. He said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord and the Lord God of heaven, which made the sea. Note that he made the sea and the dry land. I would say, and he also made the bottom of the sea. You know, <laughs> so then, you know what? They, I think they knew about God in the history of Israel because let them. Verse 10, then they were exceedingly afraid. They understood that there was, I think now, this is one God. There is one true God. They probably heard in the days of ancient Israel how God did wonder miracles and things like that. That's going to get around. You cannot help it. That was probably wide known. You know, Rahab uh, heard about it. You know, there's a lot of people that heard about it but never saw it. So there was great fear. Exceedingly afraid if to the point of, yeah, you're ready to soil yourself. That's what I, that, the word exceeding cannot be any higher. Okay. <clears throat> For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord. Now they knew it. Interesting that they were worshiping their God. Now all of a sudden they know, hey, this is the God. Presence of the Lord, not a God. You see how they have to see the difference? Because he had told them. Now they know, ah, the Hebrew God is the real God. So they're, they're kind of putting that together. Then they said to him, well, what are, then what shall we do to the sea that may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. In other words, it got worse every minute, 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 minute. And you can hear the boat sound like it's getting ready to, to snap in half. I mean, you can hear the timbers shivering. Shiver me timbers, uh, timbers. That is an expression because of the boat. It, and I didn't, I kind of butchered it. But they said, throw me in the sea so that it might be calm. But actually, the word means, the word is actually silent. So, imagine that. When Jonah goes in, and you know the waves and then the winds are done, huh? -uh. At the time they do that, it would be, bam, silent. How amazing to go from a tempest, silent, instantly. See, there's little words in there that, that when, when you look at it, and I don't see a lot of this either, when I tell I have to slow down 
and go verse by verse. And, and that's the spirit. I, I can't take any credit for that. Then he said to them, Jonah, he said, here's Jonah. You know what? Take me up, cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm to you. For I know that it is for my sake that this great tempest is upon you. Interesting. In other words, that's a suicide verse. That don't mistake that. Jonah is saying, I'm done. Throw me overboard in a tempest. Do you think he would survive? He knew he wouldn't survive. That's a death wish. He still was resisting God to the point of wanting to commit, in his, uh, well, commit suicide. That's basically in a way. Nevertheless, and I love this about, these are pagan men, these are unconverted men, remember. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring him to the land. Verse 13, but they could not, for the sea kept growing more and more tempestuous. And so did Jonah, by the way. Nevertheless, so you know, what I like about this is the men knew that they didn't want to take Jonah's life. So they, okay, let's try harder. And let's try harder. Human effort is not going to work against the God of the universe. They're trying to go against, kick against the goad, so to speak, is what Paul was told. It wasn't working. And in verse 15, Jonah chapter 1. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased. In other words, right at that moment, the sea stood silent. The word silent means absolutely total. There was nothing. Guess what? Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly again and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and they made vows. And I think we have the wrong God. This is the real God. I have just seen with my eyes. This is the real deal. These others, throw them into the water and let them drown because they can't swim. So I thought that was kind of interesting. They, so... They use Jonah's disobedience. Jonah's disobedience, running from the Lord, <coughs> caused these men to be saved. So even a horrible, what a horrible witness, what a low down Jonah, I believe, that's God. So I guess the point is you can take the worst, worst uh, job of witnessing to somebody and butcher it to pieces and just like, man, I really blew that. And the guy may come back someday. You love me enough to tell me, even though I treated you like dirt. And there's another word I won't use, but I got treated and called names like that. So maybe, I don't know, that, that's, don't ever think that you, boy, I kind of didn't, I don't know how to, you know, it doesn't matter. Even to Jonah. Jonah could use, uh, God can use the worst, worst witness, because I, I, I can give an example of doing a lot of the worst. But it does work. It depends upon God, though, not upon man. So thankfully. Then, oh, by the way, they said they sacrificed uh, to the one true God. Now they got the real God instead of the, the false gods, little g. Verse 7, now the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. I like it. This is not a whale. You know, whales don't swallow people. And I, the most biggest whales they could swallow, they've got these screens, and it's not going to work. God prepared a great fish. This may have been one of the ancient dinosaur fish that were still not extinct or it could have been a fish that he prepared and made ten times bigger. You know the goldfish? There are goldfish that are big enough in the ocean to swallow a man. Goldfish! Because goldfish expand as their environment enlarges and they get smaller or stay smaller in a small container. So they grow in proportion to the size. My sister's got one a goldfish out in her big pond in a kind of a little water theme and it's a huge one. Yeah, I'm taking him home and putting him in the frying pan. He's big. She won't let me. But the point is, this great fish, it can happen. In fact, sharks actually have regurgitated still undigested human remains. But this was not a shark. I don't think we know what that was. And it's probably not our business to know what God would have told us. So I'm not going to guess. He prepared, the point is, he prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And it must have been big enough, had big enough amount to open up a man. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days, three nights. Sound familiar? Jesus. That's what he used as an example. As Jonah was in the, the grave. See, Jesus even called it the grave. And I'll tell you why he says. He was in the bowels. 
Bowels means inside the earth or inside under covering. It could be under a fish, it could be underground. Uh, bowels, uh, it basically could mean any of that. And in other words, he's dead. You would think this guy's dead. He's been swallowed. You know, if I know what happens if you eat bad fish and you get food poisoning, but, but, but what happens if you eat uh, a, bad, a bad man and you're a fish? I mean, you, what do you get? Yeah, maybe indigestion. But that's what happened to Jonah. And there he was trapped in the belly of a well. And he had no place to go. Guess what he's left to do? A lot of things, when we're left to do in our belly, in the belly of our the fish that God has put us in, what are we going to do? All we can do is pray. you got nothing. There's no doors. There's no back end. There's no fire escape. There's no way to, you know. It's impossible. Jonah prayed to the Lord. His God. Out of the fish's belly. He was praying out in out of the fish's belly. And he cried, by reason of my affliction. In other words, out of my affliction to the Lord. Guess what? He had a three-day fast. I doubt very much there was lunch, there was a buffet there. You know, it was it was not a breakfast bar there. Three days, three nights, total darkness, no food, no water, at least water you could drink. Inside of a fish, you imagine what that would smell like? With partially decay. I don't know what the fish were. He cried out of the belly of hell. See, there's the end. That's, the, that's what I was trying to point. Here, the translation is saying hell means grave. Uh, the word hell doesn't always mean hell fire or, you know, in the lake of fire. Hell is just an old English word for a potato pit. That's where the word hell comes from. They kept their, I'm going down to hell to get some potatoes. You know, that sounded weird. The old King's English, 14 and 1500s. So the hell simply means grave. It doesn't mean uh, the judgment. There's a different types of words for that. So he was in the belly of hell. So was Jesus. Cried. I cried and you heard my voice. For you had me cast into the deep, into the midst of the seas, and that the floods compassed me about. All your billows and your waves passed over me. In other words, have you seen... Uh, the perfect storm where the boat's going down and they're up here like this trying to breathe and the water's going up. I think that's what Jonah was they were encompassing. He was about ready to drown. In fact, some say that Jonah did die. But we don't know. We don't know that exactly from the text. And I'm not sure about that, so I won't say it. But the waters surrounded me. Verse 5, Jonah 2. Even to the soul. The depth closed me around about me. The weeds were wrapped around my head. This guy is in a mess. And the only way he can get out of this mess are in places like we are in that. Pray. When, when you've done all you can and you can't do anymore, then turn it over to God. Because he, he can only do what we can't do. This is where Jonah is at at this point. So now you think, surely he's softened up and he's going to repent and he's going to... Wait a second. Let's read on. I went down, verse 6, to the bottoms of the mountains. The, the, what that is saying is, literally it says, the cutting off. In other words, he's cut off from life. And you brought me forever, yet you have brought up my life from corruption. Oh, Lord, my God. The corruption, the word corruption is called, it's the pit. The pit is talking about a bad place to go. The pit of destruction. Uh, so. Here he's kind of saying, God, you, you saved my life or you brought my life up. Now, some think that maybe he was dead and he was brought back. Again, I'm not going to speculate where the, the scripture is not clear. If it's, not, if it's silent, I'm going to be silent because I, I have no business speculating unless not even on the stock market. That doesn't work very good. So. Jonah verse... 7, chapter 2, When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in into your holy temple, that they observe lying vanities, forsake their own mercy. You know what? He just admitted he made a mistake. You see what he just said? And I'll sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that which I have vowed. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited out Jonah. Upon the dry land, maybe he kind of made him sick to his stomach. And more literal translation is God caused the great fish to deposit him on land. Now, this is not your prince's cruise. 
Okay, but he did bring it to the right place. And the fish delivered him just exactly where he needed to go. So you would think, and I'm never going to get through all of this, this book, but I'm going to at least let you look at it. When he got out, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. First time didn't work. Jonah 3 verse 1. Arise and go to Nineveh. Again. Go to Nineveh. In other words, go to the people who are trying to kill you and all of your people. I want you to be witness to the people who are trying to wipe you out and hate you. I'm not sure that that'd be an easy thing to do. It's, it's a lot scarier than you would think. I've seen some depictions of Nineveh. It could be 150, 180,000. It could be 100, almost a million. It could be probably under that. I think it's like several hundred thousand. And Nineveh was not just a city. It was a city state. Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it. The great city meaning it's not a really great. If they were great at anything, it was great at sinning. Okay. Great just means huge or large. So Jonah went up, went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. So far, so good. Jonah's actually doing what he's supposed to do. And Nineveh was an exceedingly great city of three days' journey. Imagine that. If I went through Wichita on foot, it would still not be as big as Nineveh. I could probably walk through Wichita three days on foot. That's what this is meaning. It was so great that it took him three days to go across. Or it could have taken three days to get to where he was at. But either way, Nineveh was at a humongous, humongous city. So Jonah began to enter the city. A day's journey, and that's why I was correcting myself. It's only a day's journey. It was three days to Nineveh, one day across. My apology. And he cried out, yet 40 days, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. 40 days, testing. 40 days is a number to see if they would repent. Guess what? The people of verse 5 believed in God and have proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. That's when the Word of God came. Next time, I'm going to show you, finish the book of Jonah, and show you why Jonah was still not finished and why we are a little bit like Jonah in the second half of the book of Jonah about being kind of, I would say, the reluctant witness. And you know, interesting, they call Jonah a prophet, but Jonah was a, was he a prophet or was he an evangelist? I, the only reason I say he is a prophet even though he doesn't call him that, because he recorded the words of God. And prophet might be the idea that is teaching. But you don't put... It's not like prophesying thousands of years from now. So, we'll finish that next time. Donnie, would you close for us? Dear Father, thank you for this message that you put on Jack's heart to teach us. We just thank you for this Lovely day we had, the, the Sunday school message we talked about. We just asked that you'll take what Jack has said and spread it to others. Be with us through today and the rest of the week so that we can come back next Sunday and hear the rest of the story that you have given Jack to tell us. And these things we ask in your son's name. Amen. Thank you, Donald.